and Joel Hay is a professor at USC, and he's at the Leonard Schaefer Center for Health Policy and Economics. So welcome. So Medicare, as you all know, is it covers 48 million people right now, approximately about $520 billion cost in 2010. And that's about 15% of the federal budget. So guess what? It's on, the, it's on the block just like everything else right now. There's all, all kinds of talk about what is going to happen with Medicare going forward. And the only thing we can say with certainty is that nobody really knows what's going to happen. Uh, there are a number of changes and cuts that are possible. There's already some things that have gone into effect in the ACA that slow the spending growth in Medicare going forward. But that's not enough. The Congress is very interested in doing more, so I think we're going to hear more from Congress possibly about what they're going to do. There's this thing called the Super Committee, which is supposed to come up with ways to cut lots and lots of money from the federal budget, including from Medicare. And there's something, if they don't actually accomplish that, there's going to be a, an across-the-board 2% cut in a lot of things. So all of these things are going to affect Medicare. And it's going to affect providers, and it's going to affect enrollees. So it's going to affect people that you are writing about, businesses in your community, that type of thing. Some, some of the changes that have been proposed include raising the eligibility age, uh, increasing costs to enrollees. That was the Paul Ryan plan that was mentioned at the luncheon would change Medicare from the way it is now where you get a defined sort of benefit. Here's what you get, here's your, here's your coverage, to something that's called the defined contribution where the government's going to pay a certain amount toward your care and then if you want to buy a higher plan or more expensive plan, you will pay the difference. And so that's also under discussion. Cutting payments to providers is obviously also going to be on the table and something that will play out in your areas with doctors and hospitals and others. So with that said, I'm going to let our speakers each give a presentation, and then we're going to have plenty of time for questions afterward. So I encourage you to think of those and think about what you want to ask. So. I'm going to let Joel take the away. Thanks, Julie. Um, get my presentation here. Okay. Um, as a, as an economist. Um, which is known as the dismal science. Uh, this is a very appropriate topic for me, and particularly Halloween weekend, because this is a nice, scary, dismal time to talk about Medicare. Um, <clears throat> so the biggest problem that we face in Medicare, uh, not to mention other health care programs, but Medicare particularly because it is a federal entitlement, is expenditure growth. And uh, what are we going to do about that? And in particular, how does that affect, that is whatever we do about it, the iron triangle of health care, which says that you can improve health care in any one direction on the triangle, but in doing so, you will worsen it in any other direction. Um, and no one that I'm aware of has yet come up with a... Uh, politically feasible intervention that can deal with all three of those problems simultaneously. So here's the, the first scary news. If you look at Medicare spending over time, uh, from 1968 up through 2010, uh, relentless increase in health care costs as a percentage of GDP, so it's outstripping the rate of growth of the economy uh, pretty much continuously uh, year after year, and things will get much worse just in the next decade as those of us who are baby boomers uh, retire. We will see a doubling of Medicare spending from 2010 to 2020 up to almost $1 trillion per year by 2020. According to the Medicare trustees report, the Medicare program by itself is the single scariest thing that the federal government is involved in. It has unfunded liabilities of $50 trillion. Uh, 
there's no way you can tax the rich and get $50 trillion. Medicare expenditures are expected to increase in future years at a faster pace than either workers' earnings or the economy overall, uh, from 3.2% in 2008 to 11.4% in 2083. And the growth of this magnitude, if realized, would substantially increase the strain on the nation's workers, Medicare beneficiaries, and the federal budget. Um, and this is the fundamental funding problem. It's true for both Social Security, uh, but particularly for Medicare, which is that these are pay-as-you-go schemes. Um, it has always been a fiction that the money that is contributed by today's worker is put aside to pay for their future hospitalizations or, or other um, uh, benefits. And in fact, uh, what's happening is that the demographics are starting to hit with a vengeance. Um, even as recently as 2000, there were four workers for every beneficiary, so you can divide up the cost per beneficiary. Uh, each worker only has to pay 25% of that. Uh, by 2030, that's down to about 2.3 workers per beneficiary. So if we're looking at Medicare costs today of about $15,000 per recipient, um, and that's clearly going to go up because no one has figured out how to get a handle on healthcare cost containment. Uh, that means that two workers uh, are each going to be paying at least $10,000 uh, to cover just the Medicare costs um, of the retirees in 2030. So if Social Security is a Ponzi scheme, then Medicare is a Madoff scheme. Resolving the Medicare funding issue is infinitely more difficult than resolving Social Security. Social Security is just money. It's just a question of transferring money from, from one group of people to another group of people. And obviously that can create some political uh, and other controversies, but it's just merely a transfer problem. Resolving the Medicare problem, which is a much bigger money problem, is going to have to get very deeply into the lives of healthcare providers and obviously healthcare patients. Uh, it's going to have to make uh, very difficult decisions as to who gets what. Um, we've talked about some of the options, but ultimately they're going to have to be some very tough decisions about what treatments go to what people. Um, and as we sit here today, none of these options are politically feasible. Um, and uh, Greece, unfortunately, I think is uh, the best uh, precursor for where we are when it comes to Medicare debates. Um, we keep putting it off and we're not uh, anywhere close to coming up with, uh, with any type of meaningful solution. Remember, Greece invented democracy and it's not clear that de democracies are very good at resolving some of these difficult questions. Now, uh, Medicare, controlling Medicare will involve some combination of cutting benefits, increasing taxes, uh, reducing payments to providers, uh, but the real payoff in terms of ways that can resolve the Medicare problems without putting a lot of constraints on the people that actually need care or the taxpayers or government programs is to get rid of the unnecessary or harmful uh, health care, which is about 30% of all U.S. health care. Um, and the way to do that is to use methods of uh, outcomes research, comparative effectiveness research, find out what works, what doesn't work, and then get serious about um, not paying for stuff that doesn't work. Um, this is a recent article by Jane Gross in New York Times, How Medicare Fails the Elderly. And uh, I think this was even the byline. Useless and harmful services for many elderly, but they're paid for by Medicare. Medicare has absolutely nothing to prevent people from not only getting unnecessary expensive services, 
but from services that actually harm them. There is no feedback mechanism to prevent that. And she talks about uh, several items, feeding tubes, gallbladder surgeries, abdominal surgeries, joint replacements, tight glycemic control. And you can argue that, that each one of these interventions for some patients in some circumstances may make sense, but if you're talking about a patient with multiple comorbidities uh, at age 80, 90, uh, with dementia, um, not expected to live very long, you know, what is the point of a joint replacement or maintaining uh, very good glycemic control so they don't get diabetes? Um, these things don't make sense, but they're done routinely in the Medicare system. And of course, I'm sure you're all familiar with the Dartmouth at Atlas, which is a tremendous resource. They've documented enormous variations in Medicare costs, Medicare outcomes, Medicare hospitalizations, readmissions, deaths. Um, you can see these very nice graphs showing the difference between different regions, different urban areas, different rural areas in terms of, in this case, patients readmitted within 30 days uh, following a medical discharge. You can see the same thing with uh, surgical discharges and then you can look at this table um, in one of their most recent reports showing enormous variation across different conditions. Uh, readmission uh, to hospital subsequent to an admission for one of these different outcomes. Uh, you know, one of the best pieces of health journalism ever done, of course, was Atul Gawande's article in uh, the, New, the, uh, the Atlantic, I, New, no, York. New Yorker, uh, comparing uh, El Paso, Texas um, with, um, what's the other city? Uh, McAllen. And uh, it's just a beautiful comparison of how in, uh, in, in McAllen they're spending almost as much per Medicare recipient as the income per capita of the people in McAllen, Texas, just on Medicare. In El Paso they spend half that and there was no evidence at all that he could find that there was anything worse off about the Medicare recipients in El Paso compared to uh, McAllen. But the problem is, I mean, Gawande writes a beautiful article uh, and, and many other beautiful articles, and nothing happens. You know, Jack Wenberg started the uh, Dartmouth Atlas project dealing with uh, tonsillectomies and appendectomies uh, back in the 70s, and we're now four decades later, and there hasn't been any impact of any of that work, or not much. So where are we today? We're, we're at a gridlock. Uh, it's Metascare versus death panels. Again, perfect for Halloween. Uh, Medicare is still based on an antiquated fee-for-service payment system with no meaningful supervision or cost controls. And as a, an economist, I just love this. It is illegal under Part D and also under the comparative effectiveness research laws to do cost-effectiveness analysis. I could go to jail for my research if, if I did it for Medicare Part D. That shows how messed up we are in terms of having an adult discussion about efficient allocation of healthcare resources. It's illegal for me to do it. Um, and another big item, the $300 billion Medicare doc fix. Uh, if we can't even resolve that one issue that's been on the table for five years, um, how do we expect the super committee or anybody else to resolve any of these Medicare payment issues? Uh, and my projection, not that I'm a, a political forecaster, but um, I think it's very un unlikely that the budget super committee will resolve uh, these issues uh, by November. I think uh, both sides of the political aisle will be quite happy to have an impasse where we have these so-called automatic uh, cuts in defense and Medicare because I think they can uh, jimmy their way around it for one more year. At least they bought uh, time to the next budget uh, deficit ceiling increase um, until after the election. So I think both sides will kind of uh, Mickey Mouse their way through the election to see if that creates a uh, greater consensus one way or the other. Um, 
So it's hard to see how anything short of government financial meltdown will resolve the Medicare funding problems. Europe is a warning for how difficult it is to resolve these issues politically, even when the stakes are enormous and the solutions are obvious. Now, just yesterday, there was some agreement, apparently, in the European negotiations about uh, the Euro financing, but if you look at the fine print, they punted. They didn't really resolve how they're going to come up with the, I think, $1.4 trillion bailout fund and who's going to contribute what. So these things are always just kind of pushed down the road a little bit further. We think the Budget Super Committee is going to do it, get pushed down the road a little bit further. Um, and even if the election changes the political landscape in Washington, that will also probably be temporary uh, for the next four years because I don't think either side, the Democrats or the Republicans, have much to gain personally from compromising on this until we get to total uh, uh, meltdown. Uh, thanks. We're going to wait for questions.